We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Welcome all of you. Thank you for coming today. I'm Edward Choi, the moderator at the workshop 214, Achieving Sustainable Local and Nature Conservation. This is a relevant issue for IGF this year. The internet and other digital technologies can pose environmental challenges, for instance, through energy consumption for data production. But they can also be leveraged to advance environmental sustainability. Therefore, Policies and actions are needed to green the internet, reduce the environmental impact of new technologies, including artificial intelligence and big data, and facilitate their use to address environmental challenges. This is something our social enterprise, Ver Hong Kong, has done a lot of work in Hong Kong. With the spread of the online platform for low-cost airlines, the European Commission reported in 2015 that the tourism sector accounts for 5% of global carbon emissions. We take the role of exploring local attractions, organizing local tours and educational workshops to encourage Hong Kong people to travel locally so as to reduce carbon footprint per capita. We dedicate our effort as youth to influencing Hong Kong people to medicate climate change through our digital platform since 2015. But that alone wasn't enough. This workshop aims to provide a platform for the IT developers, digital innovators, policymakers, and civil society across Asian Pacific to discuss how the development of digital infrastructure could enhance sustainable local tourism and nature conservation. It is at the intersection of what government, business, technical community, alongside civil society do best, which is to help promote environmental education and build awareness on environmental sustainability within internet governance and digital policy spaces. I would like to introduce our co-organizers here. We have the Net Mission Ambassadors Program, which aims to bring together a network of dedicated young uh, volunteers devoted to promoting and contributing towards a collaborative and sustainable internet and youth engagement on internet governance. We also have social responsibility practitioners, an NGO which aims to carry out social responsibility initiatives, promote the stories of practitioners, and to set up a network for SDG-related communications and implementation. Time to introduce our speaker, we have Mr. Polushutam Kanal, the chairman of the Nepal Telecommunications Authority. Mr. Kam Sing Wong, secretary for the environment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Ms. Natalie Chong, the co-founder of Fair Hong Kong. Ms. Tui Ray, the founder of Social Responsibility Re Practitioners. And Edmund Chong, the CEO of Dog Asia Organization. Each speaker will have their opening remarks and after that, we will have a 25-minute panel discussion. Natalie Chung and I will report back and conclude with a youth statement with key takeaways. And Q&A session will come afterwards. May I first invite Mr. Tsui Ray, please. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yep, you can yeah. start. Okay, hi, everyone from New York. This is Ray, founder of Social Responsibility Practitioners. I'm really honored to be invited to this session and to talk about the sustainable local tourism and natural um, conservation. So let me briefly introduce myself. I'm the founder of this NGO and our organization aims to use youth power to carry out social responsibility initiatives to promote the stories of practitioners and set up a network for SDG related communication and implementation in various ways, such as youth exchange study and across industry collaboration. And since like 
we started our organization during the outbreak of pandemic of coronavirus, which is still lasting for like almost two years or even like more than we expected. So actually our main method to promote our like activities, events and our stories is using internet. And I would like to share some different types of ways to do the digital promotion for sustainable local tourism and nature conservation, and then share something um, about the previous like uh, projects we have done before with the Philippine based um, social enterprise. So like for forms of digital promotion, um, social media is definitely a really powerful platform for you to leverage all the resources you have and decrease your uh, cost in the minimum way. So like on social media, you can try to encourage conversation. Like you can use the travel influencers to write about ecotourism and promote promote it to their network and encourage conversations about this topic topic and at the same time you should open your like comment area and let people to make comments under their posts and second you can use some infographics so actually if you only use text-based information or only use like data sometimes it's kind of abstract especially for this topic we have some like more difficult like terms for people to understand so like for this way we tend to use like infographics to like introduce like specific like um, professional terms but at the same time you can add on um, some like activities like events that will have like a considerable impact on the uh, on the public so thirdly we can try to build up an activity an active community it, it is actually what srp is always doing like we because we are in mainland China and most of people are using WeChat as their like um, social networking app. So we use WeChat, uh, WeChat to create multiple like communities. Like we just share our post and we organize like various like webinars and people tend to join it just like use internet instead of like we only meet in person, which may be a little bit impossible due to the coronavirus. And this community can use to like for members to share their needs, expectations, and otherwise in order to fostering a feeling of friendship and family and promoting better cooperations between individuals or organizations. Um, so that's basically the forms of digital promotion that I want to introduce. And in the later part, I would like to like introduce more details about how we help the Philippine based uh, social enterprise to design a tourism package to like not only protect their environment, but also to increase its economy in the little island in Philippines. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ray Ray. Uh, actually, I have followed the SLP uh, we WeChat page, so I can see there a lot of influence, uh, and yes. you had shared a lot of uh, eco tourism related stuff on your page. So it is very very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Mr. Edmund Chong, please, so you can talk about uh, your initiative in Dot Asia organization? Certainly. Um... Uh, thank you, first of all, for, for inviting. Uh, very happy to share some of the work that uh, we are doing at Dot Asia. I wonder if I can show a little bit my screen, um, uh, yeah. some of the things. Um, but okay. Uh, well, one of the uh, uh, main things that Dot Asia does is, of course, um, operate the, the Dot Asia top level domain, and that's uh, w w part of our, our core. Uh, operations, um, but most, of, all, actually all of our income goes back into supporting internet development and adoption around Asia. Uh, one of the areas that we have been supporting is uh, sustainable development, um, especially sustainable development goals. And um, since 2016, when the SDGs were put in place, actually 
Dot Asia has been supporting a, a project we call Ajitora. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it starts with tiger as a symbol of Asia, um, but also uh, focuses on uh, sustainable development and also uh, um, sustainable tourism uh, to, to many extent, especially uh, the, 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 well, uh, before the pandemic, at least the growing uh, natural um, uh, tourism and uh, the local tourism uh, to, 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 I guess, exotic um, uh, tropical and uh, other uh, wildlife areas. Um, and so that's, um, this is one of the, the projects that we've been doing is, uh, and um, it's, it's an education project more than anything. And it goes to um, uh, 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 primary, secondary schools and other, uh, other students and youth to engage them about the, the um, uh, internet. But um, uh, what is uh, uh, we what we've recently been doing is a um, eco eco internet initiative that, that we have been working with APNIC Foundation and HBS. Uh, we're very excited to, to have HBS uh, help fund our, our work in this area, uh, and uh, of course Aji is involved in this to 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 as an advocacy for um, an eco internet. Um, just quickly, it um, won't go into the, the, the presentation. Actually, this was presented at earlier at, um, the, uh, at a different session here at the IGF. And uh, what it does is that it looks at the, the, the situation for of, of online and how the internet uh, actually has an impact on uh, carbon footprint. Um, but the question we ask mostly is how the uh, internet footprint actually um, replaces a lot of the, the physical footprint that we do and how the power grid is such a big uh, issue. Uh, one of the things that we also observe is that the, the capacity and the bandwidth of the, the infrastructure is important, but most importantly, the, the, you know, how we think about the digital economy advantage. So, so we put together a, a pilot for a uh, indicator on how how eco-friendly really uh, is the internet for different jurisdictions looking at three axes, economy, energy, and efficiency. Um, and we took, uh, as, the, as the pilot study, we actually took uh, six jurisdictions or economies and we looked at the situation, how the percentage of the digital economy versus the internet carbon footprint. And here you see the, the, the scores of different uh, regions. Hong Kong is particularly bad at this, but, uh, and the other uh, uh, axes as well, for some reason, actually, maybe uh, later on, we, 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 can, we, can, we can think about that. But here, this is another axis is about renewable energy and the grid emission factor. And here you see that um, uh, how much percentage of uh, renewable energy is the power grid actually uh, uh, including, and also you know, because this is the power that this is the energy that powers the internet, and the more renewable energy, the the better. And here is very strange. I, I I don't know whether the the stats is right, but but again, Hong Kong and Singapore is a very low uh, amount. Um, won't go into the details of it, but ultimately um, there's a scoring, and this is a a, a pilot study. Uh, Japan seems to be doing well. Hong Kong doesn't seem to be doing that well. Um, again. Uh, we, we are looking at expanding to, to different economies to look at, you know, how the power grid uh, supports the internet and how efficient the, the internet uh, itself in terms of power consumption and carbon footprint is. Um, so this is um, some of the things that, that we have been doing. Um, and I think um, as we go into, uh, especially the last couple of years, it's becoming a big uh, issue because there's a lot of uh, talk about um, how the internet is increasingly a big part of the, uh, the, the digital footprint. Our research though has found that it's, it's not so, um, uh, you know, it's not like a doomsday situation. However, um, I think policy support to, to, to nudge the, the, the industry towards uh, cleaner energy is very important. And also the participation from industry, from government and from uh, civil society is important to, to push forward an agenda 
for a, a, a cleaner uh, internet and a cleaner power that powers the internet. And hopefully, uh, whether it's tourism or uh, local or, or, or otherwise, um, the internet is an indis the indispensable part of um, of uh, of our everyday experience. Uh, so, um, making sure that the internet is powered with with uh, with clean energy is is a big part of um, uh, our uh, advocacy work, and also uh, hopefully it's useful for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, basically, I have been follow up uh, the Ajitora project since I was in year one. So that is about four or five years ago already. And I can see uh, there are many outreach projects in Kobe, Japan, like two or three years ago. Uh, so, and the things will be keep going on. And yeah, I appreciate your effort. OK, so can I please invite Mr. Kem Seng Won to have your opening remark, please? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, very clear. Okay. Okay. Let me open my PowerPoint. Is it okay? Uh, Please uh, allow my PowerPoint. Uh, not yet. Okay. Please confirm. Can technician team uh, to see if there are any issues like, yeah, Mr. Wong seems cannot uh, share the screen. Okay, so the team uh, kindly asking, uh, inviting you to, you know, to share the screen again to see if there is any problem. Or, yes, I can, okay. Uh, yes, I can problem. see uh, your screen now. Yep, so. some problem uh seem is there is some problem so uh, i i do have a okay is it okay yeah very very clear thank you so much okay sorry for it okay uh not to hear the sharing by other people uh, i would like to start with that hong kong is a highly urbanized city but in fact we only have urbanized about 25% of our land. That means the rural and countryside areas accounts for about some 70% of our territory. It's one of the pictures showing our Hong Kong's global geo park. And this year we celebrate the 10th anniversary to recognized by the United Nations UNESCO. So welcome to Hong Kong to visit it. It's very beautiful. And I, as the Environment Minister, look after climate change, energy, including the renewable energy. I would respond to the comment about renewable energy, as I mentioned earlier. And I'm also looking after air quality, power diversity, waste management, etc. So ecotourism is part of our agenda item under the biodiversity and nature conservation. And I would like to highlight that we also issued the Smart City Blueprint 2.0 uh, last year and updated our climate action plan this year. Overall, we set a target to become carbon neutral before 2050. Currently, in, in fact, in Hong Kong, the, the zero carbon power mix accounts for about 25%. Although our renewable energy mix is rather small due to the uh, geographical constraint, if we account for the net zero carbon power source is about 25%. And by some 2030 or 35, we would like to increase it to 60 to 70%. I would like to firstly share with you the Smart City Blueprint that there are a few areas in relation to the topic today. For instance, about hiking in Hong Kong, we would like to improve the mobile network coverage even in remote areas so that we can ensure the security and safety of hikers. We are also to improve collection with the remote villages for their security and also to promote ecotourism. We are also using AI, artificial intelligence and robots in conserving, conserving our nature, for instance, to detect hillfires so that we can identify the 
hill fires outbreaks so that fully uh, with the AI so that we can uh, conserve our forest and country parks as soon as possible. We are also having the uh, other schemes uh, using technology to conserve the nature conservation and we are updating our smart city European regularly so that we can promote everything, including the smart and brown. And as mentioned earlier, we have launched the climate action plan together with other environmental group in this year. Uh, here you can see that uh, in the upper left corner, uh, we are going to in increase Hong Kong's net zero carbon power emission portion. Uh, currently is about 25% and increases to 60 to 70% before 2035. And we would uh, make Hong Kong carbon neutral before 2050. And here I would like to share with you that we do have an overall strategy to make Hong Kong go carbon neutral. So that would cover ecotourism, internet use, etc. As a policymaker, that I would have to set the framework for the whole city. For instance, I set up the topmost highest level steering committee with the chief executive, that is the topmost officer in Hang, together with the other ministers, like the one on uh, information and technology, et cetera, so that we can promote the policies and initiative. At the same time, we have to assign budget. This time is the first time of its kind in Hong Kong to assign a climate budget, 240 billion Hong Kong dollars for the coming 10 to 15 years on everything about climate mitigation and adaptations. So if you do some, you think that it's one of the agenda items that we cover the, under the budget. And we'll set up a dedicated office on climate change and carbon neutrality. And we'll set up an advisory committee, including key stakeholders, and in particular, including young people, so that we can promote low carbon lifestyle, including tourism in the coming time. And public engagement is important. At the same time, we promote green economy, including tourism, et cetera. At the same time, capacity building is important. So we are seeing and promoting universities in town to uh, devise courses, degree courses, training, et cetera, so that we would have the relevant talent and young people to support the low carbon lifestyle and industry. At the same time, we will have the carbon neutral communities. It's not only, not only about urbanized area, but also wetland conservation, new country parks, and also uh, the global geoparks area that we can make them low carbon in the coming time. And we have also launched the Hong Kong Biodiversity Strategy Action Plan uh, in 2016. And that will cover part of the ecotourism aspects that balance the nature conservation, uh, local economy, and also the tourism issue. And another new initiative that we launched three years ago is have a new office called the CCO, Countryside Conservation Office in Hong Kong under the Environmental Protection Department. That is to upkeep the remote countryside areas to be living. Because without government intervention, they would be dying. So we like to conserve the architecture, heritage, culture, local economy, including local tourism. And the recent example is the Light Tree Wall Rural Cultural Landscape that just got one of the highest awards in Asia. That's let's go to Asia Pacific Award for Cultural Heritage Conservation that we got it last year. That recognized how the local communities, universities, villages, and NGOs are working together to conserve the village and promote ecotourism in a smart, low carbon manner. That is the picture showing the very beautiful water village. 10 years ago, it was almost dying, but now it's being revitalized and recognized by Safe Platform, where the Lonely Planet recommended it as one of the Let's go in Hong Kong. You are coming to visit Hong Kong, and I would like to add that uh, the government departments uh, are also working on the integration of the technologies. Here is one of the example with the Cat O, it's a remote island. Uh, there is a new heritage trail just opened last year, and we would like to try to integrate the smart technology along the trail that people can scan the QR code and. Uh, and get the information about the history, heritage, etc. 
you can see the example that uh, they are showing kind of the old uh, custom and operations in the village for the QR code. And this is the real picture of the uh, village. And you can see that uh, along certain uh, area, there's a lot of trees. So if people are going to choose the QR code, uh, you may find your lover. And I would like to end with that. Uh, we have just launched a new policy area. It's called the Lawful Metropolis Development Strategy. That is about the lawful part of the Hong Kong territory, covering about one third of our total land area. That's linked to Samjan, I mean, the Greater Bay areas, other areas. They cover very important world class wetland, also other uh, country park areas. We are going to develop it the whole area into an innovation and technology hub. At the same time, we will let you actively conserve the wetland and also integrate the uh, conserved area together with the southern counterpart so that we can make it highly livable, low carbon, smart, and also enjoyable living environment. So we are going to consider how we can learn from you guys and make the tourism as one of the enjoyable activities in the northern metropolis in the coming time. So I would like to end here and learn more from uh, the young people here and welcome to Hong Kong if the pandemic allows. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your sharing. And I can see uh, there are a lot of uh, questions coming in in the chat box. So do feel free to ask any question uh, during every any time uh, in, in the workshop. So yeah, so we will have a Q&A session after that. Um, and at the same time, I can see that although uh, Apart from Zoom chat, we also have the YouTube live channel right now. So uh, participant here in the YouTube can kindly share your question as well. So thank you for all the participants and thank you for all the uh, guest speaker for your insightful sharing. So now I think we will move to the panel discussion to talk about how uh, the stakeholders from different sectors and regions could cooperate to achieve sustainable local tourism and nature conservation via digital cooperation. So uh, may I first ask Edmund please, like, as you have mentioned in the opening speech, combating the illegal trade in wildlife and wildlife products on the internet has become an urgent issue. In like August 2019, traffic and non-governmental organization working globally uh, uh, on trade in wild animals and plants in the context of both diversity, conservation, and sustainable development. So it is published by, uh, it is a study uh, published Title Combating Wildlife uh, Crime Links to the Internet, Global Trends and China Experience. So while it covers like the experience of how China, the EU, Kenya, the US, and several key international international associations uh, combat uh, wildlife crime with notable success, the report in particular points out that wildlife cybercrime is not yet regarded as a crime category in its own right uh, in international and national legislation and related policy and law enforcement actions are not sufficiently comprehensive or targeted. From your point of view, what are the greatest ob obstacles to taking substantive measures domestically and internationally? And how can the technical community alongside both the public and the private sector cooperate for addressing illegal wild trade, wildlife trade links to the internet? Thank you. Um, I, I think that's a... That's a good question. I think um, uh, uh, the first thing, I think the most important thing is probably awareness. Um, the, the community that we're dealing with, especially when we talk about the ISPs and, and hosting providers and platform providers are, are simply, you know, this uh, illegal wildlife trade hasn't been uh, on their radar screen. There are, uh, uh, if you walk around the IGF, you would see, you know, uh, there would be a lot of talk about cybersecurity. There would be a lot of talk about uh, privacy. There would be a lot of talk even about uh, um, child sexual abuse material, uh, protecting the children. However, the wildlife trade issue is, is not, not a high uh, priority issue. Um, I remember us uh, bringing this up a few years ago and, you know, consistently bringing the the, the topic to, to discussion and um, the awareness um, is is low and the 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 sense of urgency is low but the reality as you just quoted is that um, 
the reality is that because of the because of a line actually illegal wildlife trade um, including some uh, wildlife kind of illegal activities that are uh, related to to tourism is on the rise. Uh, well, a- actually, I should say on the rise before the pandemic. With the pandemic, uh, I guess it's a good thing in that sense, if, if you will. But um, uh, uh, before the pandemic, because of the the internet and the uh, uh, a lot of the reasons behind it, uh, it makes it easy. It makes it uh, possible to you know really buy a tiger for a pet from the U.S. and a click of a button and then the tiger sent to your you know doorstep and that's not um very conducive to 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 tracking it down and uh uh, uh, uh stopping it and so what is uh, alarming and uh, uh surprising for a lot of people is that in fact what we think uh, that the illegal wildlife trade is probably going down the drain is actually not it's actually a growing business and and that's not a good sign so besides awareness, I think the other main issue is, is to really follow the money. Um, like a, a couple of the, the, the successful uh, approaches for addressing, for example, uh, CSAM, the child sexual abuse material, is to follow the money, whether it is advertising money or it is the money actually for the transaction of uh, uh, illegal wildlife uh, materials. I think um, whether it's credit card uh, companies or um, online pay- payment platforms, um, they need to be aware and put in place policies to 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 tackle uh, illegal wildlife trade. I think um, that's you know to me, you ask me whether you know what are the the main obstacles. I think awareness uh, and priority is the main obstacle, and then. Um, you know, being able to to follow the money is going to, I think, be the the most impactful uh, approach. Yep. So I can hear the keyword money. So, <laughs> in terms of money, I do believe that it is money which boosts uh, the progress and the development of the international, uh, I mean, uh, international techno- technological advancement. So I, I I I'm quite curious about like. How Hong Kong uh, government engaged uh, the prominent stakeholder for promoting IND development and green IND. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Mr. Wong, can you please share yeah, with us that uh, apart from money, so what else or uh, what is the current practice that the Hong Kong government is currently doing in order to boost uh, the IND uh, development as, uh, alongside um, the R- uh, green IND stuff? Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think you are asking a very broad question. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, in the last term of government, we founded a new ministry, a new bureau. It's on innovation and technology with possible funding to promote innovation and technology in general. Certainly similar to other cities, sustainability in development is part of the funded or promoted items under the innovation and technology in general. So I think that is a very uh, general response, but I think the government similar to other cities are promoting smart city. That's why in my presentation, I mentioned that the smart city group in that is the version 2.0 just launched last year. And within that uh, group in, you can see that there are six major areas. And one area is on the environment. If you talk about green and ecotourism, that is covered uh, within the six key areas at different locations. But I would like to share with you what the Environment Bureau, that's my bureau, is doing about that. And we are supporting or engaging the stakeholders in different ways. For instance, I mentioned that three years ago, we found an innovative office for the Countryside Conservation Office. That is to help to revitalize remote villages. If our government intervention, they would be fading out, fading away. So we are having policies and funding to support the revitalization of those villages for heritage and cultural conservation, and at the same time to conserve biodiversity and promote ecotourism. The response has been encouraging because there are many stakeholders in Hong Kong supporting that. Universities, NGOs, in groups, 
local villages are all important players. And even the local banks, the biggest banks in Hong Kong, are providing sponsorship and funding in addition to the work government is funding them. So it's a very good collaboration. The good news is that, as mentioned in my presentation, we got one of the highest awards from the UNESCO in the Asia region to recognize our Hong Kong contribution. That's one example. Another example is the UNESCO Hong Kong Global Geo Park. They cover the eastern part of the Hong Kong territory, probably about one third of our territories. And the idea is that we would like to conserve the geo park landscape and culture, local villages there, and promote the economy. So again, we have funding, we have the staff to work with the local people to conserve the landscape and also integrate technology, uh, as mentioned earlier, in the applications. Technology is considered one of the means to achieve our ends. Our ends is to go for, say, carbon neutrality, biodiversity, cultural conservation, etc. But I would like to add that uh, before I end is that we just found the impact fund. And that is one of our uh, committee members. So we assigned uh, certain priority areas on projects to be funded under our Green Tech Fund. The Green Tech Fund is just founded last year. So it's getting very good uh, response. There are over 100 applications and we are going to start the second round of uh, applications very soon. So in short, we are having different policies funding, et cetera, to support the application technology to meet our ends on conservation, on carbon neutrality, ecotourism, et cetera. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. So I I do hope that uh, the green tech, uh, the, the second round of the green tech fund will be, you know, running very smoothly. And I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Trey Ray that, like in your point of view, what further steps can youth organization in China uh, take in order to promote the concept of uh, sustainable tourism and nature conservation through public education or even um, different packages as you have done uh, throughout the year with the Philippine-based uh, NGOs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think first of all, we still need to increase the awareness among youth because nowadays, you know sustainable development goals, but they still don't know specific like subtitles of it. They don't know like, yeah, I know gender equality. I know environment, but how can I like engage in it and implement some concrete steps and projects? So I think it's really important to let youth to know what are SDGs, not only the concept, but also like, um, the specific plans to make it come true. So like we, including SRP and other NGOs, social enterprises, or the companies has more senses of social responsibilities, we are aiming to share more stories, experience, and analysis about sustainable development for youth and young professionals who are interested in this topic to learn more about what other practitioners all around the world are doing for a better sustainability. And the yeah. second point, I would say that networking and promoting dialogues, um, especially like NGOs, like we don't have enough resources sometimes. And also our target audience are people who wishes to have more um, resources to leverage more uh, power. So I think it will be really crucial for us to provide more networking events or maybe just like introduce more um, like professors or practitioners to them in order to guide them, become their mentor, or maybe provide more like financial or labor or any kinds of support for youth who wish to implement their plans. There are many individuals and groups are doing similar things, like SRP is not the only one. We also know a lot of NGOs like VIA and um, so on, they're also doing something that's similar to us. But if we separate the, each group individually, then we can really like utilize all the resources efficiently. So we need to promote the dialogues 
as well to let these people know that what they are doing at the same time and to promote a collaboration between each like organizations. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to collaboration uh, like in the public sector and the private sector in China, uh, in the mainland China, so as to boost the whole progress of uh, how the NGO uh, leveraged on various S SDGs related issues. And uh, I think is the end of the panel discussion because I have seen that there are a lot of questions coming in in a check spot and I would like to spend more time uh, like allowing uh, the guest speaker to responding to those uh, very insightful questions. So I think uh, Natalie and I will wrap up. Uh, so Natalie, it's your turn, please. Great. Thank you so much, um, Edward, for hosting and moderating this session. Um, so good afternoon, honorable guests, speakers, and participants joining us from around the world. Thank you so much for sharing your insights at our IGF workshop, addressing the critical linkage between internet governance and environmental education. It is our pleasure as FAIR, a youth-initiated ecotourism organization, to host this dialogue with representatives from youth groups, civil society, government, and businesses to imagine the future of digital education for nature conservation across Asia. The COVID-19 pandemic reinforced the role of digital technology in driving transformations, at the same time exacerbating inequalities. Around last year's Internet Governance Forum, IGF 2020, United Nations published the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which sets out the vision of connecting, respecting, and protecting all people online. In the report, there's a quote saying, digital technology does not exist in a vacuum. It has enormous potential for positive change, but can also reinforce and magnify existing fault lines and worsen inequalities. Under the context of planetary health, IT operations consume massive amount of electricity and will remain a main contributor to climate change as Atman from Dot Asia shared. Nevertheless, Technological advancements can offer brand new solutions to environmental challenges, building a carbon conscious internet. For the ecotourism industry, virtual tours with VR and AR can increasingly provide a more holistic and fruitful user experience for tourists, such as what Secretary Wong has shared, some of the QR codes around trees in Lai Chi Wa village. And it can also enhance social inclusion through enabling the marginalized communities to engage in leisure tourism activities, such as those who are physically challenged. Mr. Kanao, um, um, reflecting upon ourselves, our organization FAIR initially started as a digital platform to showcase ecotourism sites in Hong Kong, riding on content creation and visualization to deepen our audience's understanding on the ecological, historical, and cultural background of attractions. We are able to reach a much wider audience with the power of internet, disseminating educational information through targeting to right audience with digital marketing. There is so much potential in leveraging ICT for behavioral change yet to be harnessed. Thank you, Natalie. Under the pandemic, they brought back our offline tours online, developing virtual tourism experience, and we're thinking the user journey. Our team of youth constantly drives innovative solutions to enhance the, uh, the educational effect of our initiatives and their voices should be elevated. There, together with organizations here today, um, the, Environment, the Environment Bureau of the Hong Kong SAR Government, Dot Asia Organization, Social Responsibility Practitioners, all serve as hybrid platform to nurture our next generation of environmental stewards. While youth prototype on digital solutions, we bear the responsibility to guide youth in the right direction and set boundaries for government internet resources. This includes data security and protection training uh, for government internet resources, and evaluation of data authenticity, and breaking out of echo chambers on social media platforms. For our speaker sharing today, we realize the potential of digital technologies can be best harnessed through multi-stakeholder collaborations. Youths are taking a more prominent role in the digital world from building their own startups to gathering force for activist movements. 
Eckering was Ms. Trey shared on SRP team, helping a Philippines-based social enterprise design a tourism uh, package. However, youths are also among the most vulnerable to misinformation, data privacy breaching on the internet. Therefore, youths are stakeholders whom should never be missed in the form formulation of digital policies. It is only when policymakers and businesses sit down and listen to youth and social civil society members uh, that we can collaborate inclusively and more future-proof solution for nature conservation. Futurecast founder Andrew Kin once said, being human in a digital world is about building a digital world for humans. As a youth representative, I wish all of us here can continue and unleash the potential of youth for building human-centric digital solution for nature uh, education and sustainable ecotourism. Thank you once again for your enthusiasm and we wish to join hand with you to effect change. And now, time for the Q&A. May I invite our online moderator, Ms. Jia Wenhui, to, more, uh, to, moder to facilitate the session, please. Uh, thank you, Edward, and our speakers share of your insightful understanding of sustainable local tourism and also the nature conservation. Uh, we have now some questions from the online audience in the chat box that I would like to share with you. Uh, the first question is for Mr. Kem Sing Wong. Um, Justina has asked, which of the renewable source of energy is the most effective in Hong Kong? Okay, Hong Kong, similar to other city states like Singapore, we have limited land and space and natural potentials. We don't have hydro, we don't have geothermal, but based on our latest uh, environmental blueprint, that we highlighted three key areas. One is solar, second is offshore wind, third is about waste to energy. But we need to be innovative. So according to our new climate action plan, we're looking for new technologies like in hydrogen. That means using renewable energy source or uh, zero carbon energy sources elsewhere and turn uh, the elements into hydrogen that could be transported to Hong Kong. So that would be a kind of new renewable energy that can supply to cities like Hong Kong so that we can go towards carbon neutrality within decades. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like there's a lot of information that could let the audience to know more about Hong Kong. And the second question is for Mr. Edmund. Um, Mobile, Mobile Laji uh, has asked, how do we promote internet in the rural area in developing countries? Thank you for the question. Um, again, very good question. I guess this is a question that the whole internet has been uh, grappling with uh, since the very beginning, actually. Um, I, I, I would tackle it a couple of ways. First, um, I think um, there has been a lot of discussion about whether free internet is necessarily good internet and uh, whether uh, more connectivity always means better uh, 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 you know, uh, better to, to the people. So I guess uh, the fact that I asked these questions, the answer in my heart is that no. Um, I think uh, it's very important to build up the capacity in, in the local community. Free internet, let's say, from, from you know, uh, uh, funding elsewhere going in uh, might feel like it's good, but it could really, you know, uh, 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 kill off the the, the nascent um, uh, industry uh, in in the local uh, area because um, the local ISPs might be small now, uh, but if the free internet comes in, their business will be gone. Um, and once the business environment is gone, it's very difficult to build up build that back up again. So I think when you think about um, uh, uh, funding, uh, which is important, uh, it needs to build up the industry locally rather than replace them with, with free, you know, free, free services. And then also free services needs to be really open services. Um, if it's free services only for, uh, you know, a particular platform, let's say a, a donor, 
um, you know, whoever that donor is and, and con considers only part of the internet is accessible, then that's not really a good, good connectivity. Um, on the topic that's related to our topic today, um, I don't know whether I, I still can, can share. Oh, yes, I can. Um, it's, it's also important to think about the uh, energy efficiency and, and stuff. Earlier, I, I mentioned a, a, an, an important aspect. We looked at um, the efficiency of uh, the bandwidth uh, and connectivity as well. And in the earlier session, uh, another uh, colleague uh, from A4AI, a, it's a uh, affordable internet um, uh, initiative, it looks at the, the, the situation whereby uh, when you think about carbon emission, uh, what is the reality is that when you build the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure actually uh, uh, occupies more part of the carbon footprint. So the more people you can service, in fact, the average carbon emission per user goes down. So this is one thing that, that, that is important for our topic today, I think. Um, so when you think about internet access, um, you, you have to think about the infrastructure development that supports uh, more users. The other thing to, to think about is about sharing that infrastructure. Um, just like when I, when I mentioned that the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, uh, of the infrastructure uh, of, of the network is important, Sharing that network is also important. I'm, I'm just pulling this uh, presentation from someone else uh, here, but uh, here's some, some policy recommendation for a greener internet that uh, as you uh, deploy internet connectivity to devel developing regions. And one thing to, to, remind, uh, to remember is that when you talk about the rural areas, you also, it also means that um, uh, electricity is difficult to get there as well. And today, a lot of the immediate thinking is that you would pull in diesel, uh, you know, uh, power generators to power the, 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 the towers to, to create, to provide connectivity. But I think we need to really re rethink that even for actually, especially for developing uh, areas think about renewable energy, think about solar energy, think about uh, hydro, think about uh, wind power, uh, and use that to power the infrastructure that goes into the rural areas. Um, there is no reason why that cannot be done. A lot of the, you know, uh, I think as we think about how to deploy internet into the rural areas and developing areas, uh, we should also bring the, the, the eco-friendly uh, internet, uh, you know, concept into to into that that deployment. So, I guess um, uh, uh, those are those are really my points. I think um, uh, that it's it's not just about you know uh, uh, providing you know free connectivity. It's about developing the industry. And as you develop the industry, uh, the power that 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 powers the internet is the critical part. And we should think about utilizing uh, carbon neutral or, or renewable uh, energy sources to power the network. Thank you so much for your uh, answers. Uh, the, next, uh, the next question uh, is for Sui Rui. As you have already mentioned, the COVID pandemic's influence on the operation of SRP. So um, how do you think SRP can better use digital devices in this post-pandemic era to promote the development of your organization? Yeah, thank you, Wenhui. So I think this is not only a question for like SRP, but also for other NGOs and also big companies and government to think about since we find that maybe coronavirus will last for like even longer time, especially the new variant is coming up right now. So like how to better build up your organization to promote your business with like internet. That's a really important question to think about. And actually for us, we are trying to use more like online working platform, like Microsoft team, like uh, Feishu, like Lark, uh, and other kinds of like working platforms that has like lower cost or even they're like 
totally free for NGOs. We're trying to use these platforms to increase the effectiveness like and efficiency of our daily work and also to keep like communicating. And especially for SRP and other like NGOs who has more volunteers from all around the world, time difference is also a really important question. So we tried to use like multiple um, chatting or texting apps to keep in touch, but also using email to like write more formal like messages to our clients. So I think choosing a really important online platform for like collaborating and working is important. And secondly, I would say like social media, um, like for SRP, we have like multiple social media accounts like uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and so on. Um, these like are really good like portals for audience to know more about your organization. And you should try your best to keep updating your latest news and articles. And at the same time, if it is possible to have like some small gathering, I would really suggest to have some offline events at the same time, because it will be more like real, more real to like communicate, communicate with people. And um, since like, uh, take SRP as an example, like there's someone in Europe area, there's someone like me in North America, like in New York. So it will be easier for us to uh, organize some small gatherings and small events based on our current location. So um, I would say like digital like methods will be like a huge part of our future work. But um, I just hope that uh, a little bit of offline events can be engaged in it to promote a better like efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Sure. Uh, the next question is for Miss Natalie. We have already seen uh, there's a long question from Miss Crystal's uh, first, uh, Miss Crystal's she has asked um, a question with a, with a case in Greece. So, Ms. Natalie, um, are there any ways of achieving sustainable tourism without excluding low-income people from the tourist areas? Great. Um, thank you so much for the question. I think um, this can be addressed by one of the best case study in Light Hua Village, where we are able to bring back some indigenous villages to the village by attracting them, providing them with some employment opportunities, for example, cooking traditional Hakka meals, um, running their own coffee farm, because now um, we're trying to rebrand these kind of agricultural products into a new tourism product. So through this kind of branding and marketing that we can provide assistance to local farmers, it's actually a good way to bring back um, local farming and agriculture to life and to create um, extra income source to villages. And I think another perspective to look at it is when we are able to develop a place for tourism, um, a case study in Hong Kong is in Sham Chong. After um, there are more tourist flow, the villages actually got higher bargaining power to improve some of the village infrastructure, such as the um, pier. Um, after more tourists come, it justifies the infrastructure cost to improve quality of life of villages. So there are two ways to approach it. And I guess um, maybe uh, Mr. Wong can also add on to this question, how we are able to assist and include um, local villages when we're planning for revitalization projects in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you. Let's be sharing. I think I agree with your observations. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, as mentioned earlier, that we have the Countryside Conservation Office. That's an office to serve multiple purposes, including encouraging more public from different Walks of life can access the countryside and remote villages. Um, I just went to Taiwan, uh, that latterly uh, Edward went to. When, when I stayed there last week, I encountered a school teacher taking their students from Jinbun, that is the western part of the New Territories, to the easternmost part of the Hong Kong remote village. Enjoy and understand the revitalization of farming and the village, one of the most scenic places in Hong Kong within the global geopark. 
that shows that our intervention could be to some extent successful. That is welcome. People with different affordability can enjoy Hong Kong's countryside and remote villages. So uh, I think the intervention is positive. At the same time, as mentioned by Natalie, we have intervention to help the local villages and even people outside the village can come to work and live in the village if they're interested in farming, re-farming, and also other conservation activities. It serves multiple purposes. So we do have policies. For instance, if we need to uh, make the licensing application easy, that we are considering how to work on that. If a remote village, the infrastructure, like road access, internet access, and even the drainage, sewage, etc., that the under the countryside conservation office, we assign them with funding so that they can work on those uh, remote villages. Certainly, we need to prioritize because funding is not limited. So we have the advice committee and also the government uh, colleagues from different departments came together because we need multiple disciplinary uh, interactions and interventions people on the uh, innovation technology, on conservation, and on engineering have to work together so that we can make our resources uh, used in this most effective and smart way. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for your sharing. Uh, we are actually running out of time a little bit. I think so that's pretty much what we have uh, from the Q&A session. Edward, um, hand I will hand the host back to you now. Yeah, uh, not many words to say, but I would like to give a very great thank to all of you joining today uh, on site and online. Uh, so it is indeed a very valuable opportunity for the youth uh, organization alongside government, technician, community, and businesses come together to find a solution. And uh, I hope that after today's session, uh, you will have some more knowledge and uh, experience regarding how uh, we can utilize the digital uh, infrastructure in order to um, in in order for better uh, nature conservation, as long as uh, as well as uh, um, promoting um, sustainable local tourism. So thank you so much for participating today's workshop, and I hope you have a decent weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.